Hi, and welcome to the ninth week, ninth lecture, lecture nine of Triple E 157. And in this lecture, we will be talking about digital modulation techniques. So in the previous week, we talked about or we discussed about the transition from analog signals to digital signals using the analog to digital conversion process, which is, which is a three-step process. Okay. For this week, we'll focus on how we get those set of bits from your analog to digital conversion process and transmit it safely over a wired or a, wi or a wireless channel. And that is how digital modulation works, actually. You take a bit sequence and transmit it over a channel. Okay? So this bit sequence can represent any form of data. It could be an image, it could be an audio, it could be a video, it could be a document you made in your computer, and so on and so forth. Okay? So the outline for this lecture it will, it will consist of four parts. First, an overview of how digital modulation works. Next is how we uh, transmit digital data uh, over wire channels using the baseband digital modulation techniques. The third part, we'll talk about the bandpass digital modulation techniques, how we transfer our, our uh, bits over a wireless channel, and finally, how do we analyze the different modulation te techniques using constellation maps. So just a recap of how a digital communication system works. A uh, digital communication system first takes an analog signal and converts it to a digital signal. So if your uh, data, if, your, if the information is inherently uh, in bits, say you made it in your computer, uh, you can skip this part actually. But uh, as I am uh, recording this video, uh, the analog to digital conversion for video and audio is done in my computer already. Okay, so it has peripherals that converts the analog signal to a digital signal and into bits so that it can be stored in my computer. And when I upload this video, say in YouTube or in a, a video streaming website, I'm already using this modulator here to transmit the data over a channel. Okay, So we have a sequence of bits that is the output of your encoder. Okay, sorry. A sequence of bits at the output of your encoder, the modulator will take the, this bit sequence and then transform it into something that can be uh, represent or that can be transmitted physically over a channel. It could be in the form of voltage. It could be in the form of light pulses. It could, it could be in the form of an electromagnetic wave. So it depends on the type of channel. Okay. So how you design your modulator depends on the type of channel. Okay. So, uh, the basics of digital modulation, if analog modulation impresses or your message signals are impressed upon the parameter of a carrier signal, for digital modulation, the first step is to represent these bits into symbols. Okay? These symbols are formed depending on what type of modulation you uh, use, type of modulation technique you use. So, bottom line first is you have a set of L bits, that's the basics, and you map it into symbols S sub M. So if you have a lot of bits, the output of the modulator will be a sequence of symbols. So you have heard this term before, right? Symbols. In a quantizer, okay, how is it different than from a quantizer? A quantizer maps samples into symbols also. So how is this modulator different from a quantizer? The quantizer has a fixed set of symbols. Okay? The set of symbols of a modulator can be designed freely. Okay? For a quantizer, it's fixed. Uh, if, 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 you were, if you have a, an analog signal that swings from some minimum and maximum voltage, you have to quantize that uh, based on the minimum and the maximum. Your modulator design is actually more free. So you can design a set of symbols such that you can avoid corruption because of noise, because of channel distortion, and so on and so forth. And that's the advantage of having a modulator. Furthermore, uh, some data is already digital in nature. For example, your uh, PDF documents, Word documents, uh, the data you create in your computer, they're already in bits. So the bits can be used or can uh, are used actually to store, to be stored, uh, so that we can store rather uh, an analog data into a digital system. 
And once those bits are ready for transmission, we put them in a modulator also. So that's why the modulator is separate from your quantizer. Right? And the simplest modulation scheme here is, uh, as we know, uh, these symbols will become a physical parameter. A simple uh, example would be using voltages. If you take one bit, okay, a set of only one bit for your modulator, for every bit there's an output. The simplest way to uh, modulate a, a signal is uh, an input, the, the output would be a high voltage if the bit is 1, and the input, uh, the output rather, is a zero voltage, no, no current, okay, there's no current, if the uh, input bit is zero, okay? And what's the advantage of that? The advantage of that is if you have a low voltage, okay, zero volts rather, and high voltage, so it's turned on or high. If it's corrupted by noise, you know, in the physical world, there's always noise, always distortion. So you get that form of signal right here. And you sample the signal here. Right? You sample the signal here, you get this corrupted signal that is a little bit lower. Not, li not really a little bit. It's lower than your original on signal. Okay? So if you draw a line between your on and your off, we can see that this signal still crossed that line. So the receiver will say, hmm, it's close to your on. Therefore, this symbol here that I sampled is actually bit 1. So this is the big, bigger advantage of your digital modulation compared to your analog modulation right here. So uh, it's more robust to noise since it can recover your transmission or your transmitted symbols without corruption. Okay? So it's not corrupted by your analog noise, basically. However, uh, there's still prone to bit errors. So what does that mean? What what happens when so let me just delete this. Oh, let me just clear. So what happens when you have your on, your off, and this is the decision line between them. What if your noise is very large, so it's large enough, and you sample the signal here, right? you transmitted bit 1, but when you sample the signal right here, uh, it's closer to bit 0. So the receiver will think that oh, it must be bit 0. Okay? Must be bit 0. This output here must be bit 0. Then that already is an error in the communication between your modulator and your demodulator. So this is when your whole frame is in error already. The frame is in error already for this uh, transmission. So what would happen then? So the receiver could request that the transmitter or the source should transmit that frame again. And this is done in your uh, higher layer already, transport layer. Okay. This is already done in your transport layer. So this is not the concern of the physical layer that we have here, which is the digital modulator. The job of the physical layer is to safely transmit the bits from over the channel from one point to another. Okay. So the goal here is to minimize the number of errors uh, in bits that we transmit and receive. And that's the goal of your digital modulator. Okay. We can compute the bit rate if your modulator outputs a symbol every t sub s seconds, we call it the symbol period, okay? And we have L bits per symbol right here, okay? The bit rate can be computed using this formula, where L, again, is the bits per symbol. T sub s here is the number of bits that we, uh, sorry, the number of symbols we transmit per second. So if we divide L by T sub s, we get the bit rate. So, or if we define, instead of using T sub S, the symbol period, if we define R sub S, the symbol rate, which is the number of symbols we send per second, okay, the bit rate is equal to L times the symbol rate. And if you perform dimensional analysis here, oops, sorry. If you perform dimensional analysis here, so L is in bits, sorry, uh, 
if uh, r sub b is in bits per second, okay, l here is in bits per symbol, and r sub s is in symbol per second, symbols per second. So if we cancel the symbols, we are left with bits per second. So if you perform dimensional analysis, the units are consistent. Okay. A tool to analyze our digital modulation techniques. So if we have a set of symbols, we, we create what we call a constellation map. Okay. A set of symbols is called a constellation. And to visualize that, we create a constellation map. So we'll talk about this more on the last part of this lecture. But I'll show it to you now. Okay. So if we have three bits per symbol, then that means we have eight symbols because we have eight combinations of three bits. Eight different combinations of three bits that you see here. So the job of a communication systems engineer is to design a constellation such that uh, you'll be able to space them apart. And when noise corrupts your system, let's say your symbol is displaced here, similar way to how noise corrupted the uh, high voltage, low voltage example I've shown you earlier. If your symbol is corrupted, uh, let's say it's displaced here, okay, the receiver will still understand that what you transmitted is 100, for example here. And the number of symbols in your constellation is related to the number of bits using this formula. Okay? So, in this constellation map, if we space the symbols far enough so that the noise will not be able to reach the other symbol, okay, we can say that this constellation is more reliable. Okay? So, we can measure then the reliability of a set of symbols, your digital modulator, you can uh, measure the reliability using the minimum distance between the symbols. Okay? So if you space them far enough, then we can have a more reliable digital modulation. However, here, the trade-off trade here is, if you space them far enough, then the power consumed is uh, greater. Right? So for example, for your high voltage and your low voltage, if you want to space them far enough, you need a higher voltage. And a higher voltage means higher power. And that is true for any uh, digital modulation technique. Even if it, you're using light pulse, even if you're using electro, an electromagnetic wave, uh, if you space the symbols far enough, you'll use more power. So in this way, while using a constellation map, we have already abstracted the type of uh, hardware that we use to transmit these symbols. So bottom line here is that the reliability is directly proportional to the spacing between the symbols in a constellation. We'll talk more about this, how to build a constellation later. And uh, if the constellation is larger, if you have more spacing between your symbols, then the power consumed by that constellation is larger also. Okay. So just to differentiate, uh, we have binary digits or bits, our abstract representations. I've already I've already uh, mentioned this earlier. For a baseband transmission, uh, this these bits are transported over a wire channel. It could be your Ethernet cable between your router and your PC, or the fiber optic cable between your local trunk line and the internet service provider. Okay, so uh, th these bits are coded on a voltage representation over the line, or a light representation for fiber optic cable. So the fiber optic cable quite simply can pulse your uh, light that represents one, and it's it will be off if it's bit zero. But there are more complex techniques that are used in your fiber optic cable, so we won't go there. Right? Just know that the simplest is on and off, and this is technique is called line coding. Okay, for a bandpass transmission of bits, we impress the bits over an electromagnetic wave. So uh, the parameter of an of a sinus sinusoidal carrier can be uh, can be modulated in a similar way to how we modulate analog signals. There is actually an analog between your digital modulation techniques in the bandpass and your analog modulation techniques. So your amplitude modulation has what we call the amplitude shift keying. Phase modulation becomes phase shift keying. Frequency modulation becomes frequency shift keying. 
quite easy to remember, right? So these different techniques provide different advantages that we'll go over in the next part of the lecture. Okay? So that's the end of this part of the lecture. If you have any questions, do not hesitate to leave a comment in the comment section below. Okay? Or uh, send an email to me, of course. Okay, thank you for listening, and I'll see you next meeting.